I'd like to introduce the speakers today. Um, first of all, we have the chair, Professor Helen Phelan. Helen is a musician, academic, and professor of arts practice at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick. Um, we have Dr. Daniel Bangert. He's um, Ireland's national open research coordinator based at the Digital Repository of Ireland at the Royal Irish Academy. We have Dr. Natalie Harrower. Uh, she is the director of the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, and we also have Professor David Horn, who is a pianist and composer and director of the um, Harp uh, Hub at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. We have Professor Una Hunt, um, who is a pianist and lecturer at TU Dublin Conservatoire. We have Professor Mel Mercier, the Chair of Performing Arts at the <coughs> Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick and Dr. Anu Vathbehalen, um, who is the head of the Music Doctoral School at the Sveilis Academy, University of the Arts, Helsinki in Finland. So thank you very much for agreeing to share your knowledge and expertise with us in this round table, and we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say about this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual round table. Not happily because our speakers are not virtual, but our round table is. <laughs> but we are going to present this in the tradition of a round table. I mean, we've had so many wonderful presentations and more wonderful presentations to come. But we're hoping that this session is less presentational, more invitational, conversational, perhaps provocative, and what we're really hoping is that the conversation that we have over the next hour will contribute to the, the work that is very core to um, our organization, IMBUS, and to the organization that is hosting this event, Performance Research Ireland, which is contributing our collective knowledge and expertise to building policy in Ireland. And I was thinking as I was coming up here today, as, as Denise said, I, I work in the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick. And a decade and a half ago, I was asked to design a structural doctoral program in arts practice. And I started looking around to find people, colleagues in Ireland, who had, who had done work in this area. And one name kept coming up. People kept saying to me, you need to talk to Una Hunt. And it's absolutely extraordinary, a decade and a half later, to see this gathering, um, which has been brought together by, by Una and her colleagues. And I really would like to start genuinely by marking the extraordinary pioneering work and advocacy that, that Una has done in building this, this area here in Ireland. I think that this gathering attests to both the extraordinary expansion of quality and quantity in the area of arts practice research in Ireland. The evidence is all around us. Particularly, I think, we can see a lot of evidence of consolidation at the doctoral level. And my colleague here, Mel Mercy, will be talking later on a little bit about a landscape report that we did this last year with IMBUS that really evidences that almost every HEI in Ireland that is working in the area of performing arts now has some form of artistic research, which is quite extraordinary. You know, when you think of a decade and a half ago, this was a very empty landscape. The evidence is there in terms of the Irish Research Council, the growing recognition through scholarships. The evidence is there in the presence of arts practice researchers in the Arts Council, who continue to advocate for the importance of dialogue between artistry and research. And, and I think that there's, there is a lot of support developing in Ireland, particularly, as I said, at the doctoral level. But the landscape report also showed us that, if you like, we are heading into what you might call the second generation of challenges in our area. And that second generation, again, I think is personified by many people in the room here where we have the research, people are getting their doctorates, they're getting positions in higher education, they're getting tenure, and then facing a whole new raft of challenges in terms of the recognition of outputs, the evaluation of outputs, the dissemination of outputs. And that's really what we wanted to talk about in this round table today. 
And when I was talking to Una about this, you know, it, we, we often use words of evaluation and assessment and dissemination, but actually when you pair those words back, what we are trying to do is what I think performing artists are always trying to do. We want to share the things that we value. And that is the topic of our round table today. How do we share and how do we value arts practice outputs? And part of how that happens institutionally is around the area of evaluation. How is our work valued? And linked to that is how is our work archived and shared? And so in the, in the panel of expertise that we have here today, we have people who are also representing some of the newer opportunities in this landscape, opportunities that are now available to us through open access initiatives, through the development of technology that allows us now to, to, to archive and to present our work outside of and beyond the traditional text-based forms of dissemination. So what we're going to try to do today is to talk a little bit about what's going on in Ireland, what's going on internationally, and I've, I've asked everybody here, as you know, something that, that, that performers and academics have in common is their passion for communication, and I've asked them to, to, to curb their enthusiasm to a maximum of four minutes to, to share their own expertise with you, and, and I've invited everybody to end with a question or a provocation. That will, that will initiate, as I said, what we hope this session will be, which will be a conversation between all of us, and that that conversation may allow our collective expertise to contribute to the next phase of policy development in Ireland. So the, in, in terms of our, of our panel today, I'm going to start by asking um, Una, as the, as the coordinator of this event and the current chair of Performance Research Ireland, I'm going to then change it. I'm going to do all the introductions now, and then we're going to move like a beautifully choreographed piece between each, each of the presenters. Um, Professor Mel Mercier, who's going to talk a little bit about the work of IMBUS, and particularly the landscape report. Um, and then we're going to turn to our colleagues from the, the, the Digital Repository of Ireland and the Ireland's National Open Research Coordinate, Coordinator. And then finally, we're delighted to have the two extraordinary keynote speakers from the conference to share with us their international perspective. How does that sound? Sounds good. Good, excellent. So, Una, can I turn to you to, to take the stage? Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I'd like to talk a little about the motivation behind my research journey. I think I was always interested in the subject that occupies most of my creative thoughts these days, that is, Irish music in all its forms, Irish composers, Irish airs, and the amazing history of the harp in Ireland. In that respect, I formed a great love of Irish airs through playing the Irish harp as a child. And the whole history of the harp in Ireland held great fascination for me, and it still does. But I used to wonder why there never seemed to be any music by Irish composers to play on the piano. When I came to record my first CD with my sister, she's a violinist, Vanula Hunt, we decided to record music by Irish composers. I had not realised just how hard it was going to be to get our hands on that music. But after some years of searching for scores, I started to get better at it and realised that so much of our musical heritage was already lost and was literally disappearing before our eyes. I went into the National Library of Ireland to survey their music collections, thinking that there would be nothing there, and found that while what I was looking for was indeed missing from the library, there was a whole world of Irish music and Irish composers in the National Library whom no one had even heard of. That was when I realised that I had caught the bug for research, and started this exciting and rewarding journey. I was never happier than sitting in the stacks in the bowels of the National Library, taking down yet another volume to uncover something new that had perhaps not even been looked at for a hundred years or more. It was also in the library that I discovered music by George Alexander Osborne, the pianist composer from Limerick, who went to Paris as a young man and became a good friend of Chopin's playing with the latter at his debut in Salle Playa in 1832. 
Osborne was very famous in his day. And when I went to the British Library and looked for his music, I found over 400 pieces there. So it was just like a gold mine for me. Um, he became the subject of my PhD, not so much because I wanted to have a PhD, but I wanted to take the research seriously. And I wasn't sure I was going to do that if I didn't have something formal to hang it on. And so that was my entry into formal study. There were no doctors in performance programmes in those days in Ireland, but I was at least able to tailor the PhD towards performance. Still, I felt somehow that I didn't fit into the academic sphere, and performance strengths were not really truly recognised. That feeling of not belonging has remained with me to some extent, even though I can see that the world has changed radically in the last 20 years. It's amazing to observe the talent and expertise at this festival, and I believe proper recognition is now on the horizon. But the valuing and validating of what we do is still holding us back. Not so much in terms of formal study, the doctoral programmes that are now in stream show that, at least within the university system, performance outputs are recognised. But beyond the period of formal study, there still seems little support. Much of what we do does not fit the mould. There's no doubt that the prioritisation of the monograph over all other forms of output continues to minimise arts practice achievements. And as a result, artists frequently disengage from that process. For arts practitioners, at least in terms of my own arts practice, Outputs are diverse and often there are several outputs in different media associated with one particular project. They may include a monograph, a journal article, or a book chapter, or they may not. We share our work in many public fora, such as in the media, public talks, blogs, policy input, but these can sometimes be unaccounted for and are seen not to be so academic, to say, the, the important word as articles and conference papers. One area where practice-based research wins hands down in my book is open access. What we do is by its very nature open access. The arts practitioner continually engages with general audiences and communities of interest, keeping their work relevant and bringing their research well beyond the academic sphere. But funding is still required to make high quality audiovisual materials for the internet. This is exactly the same as acquiring funding to publish a book. Yet while the latter is possible to come by, it is rare in the case of audiovisuals. The alternative? Producing amateur recordings which do not show off the artist or their work at its best. Finally, before I ask my question, um, I'd like to make an observation about the ORCID ID, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. And now it's becoming such a necessary element in any application for research funding. When updating my profile, I find myself recording other for almost every entry in the works category. This is because there are so few options in the drop-down menu, and these follow traditional lines, publication, conference, intellectual property, or other. And mine is always other. <laughs> the work type is more varied, but equally does not have suitable options either. So I have to record other there too. Um, inputting these works has to be done manually, rather than using the given links like the DOIs, etc. Um, and this is very, very time consuming. And there has to be a way to speed up this process. So I think it may take years to fully update my profile on ORCID. It's, it's so time consuming and there just has to be a more user friendly way of doing this. I wonder, is it possible to open a dialogue with ORCID on this issue? Anyway, to get back to my question, and I'll finish now, Helen, thank you. Um, I would be keen to hear from other arts practitioners 
uh, what they think about the subject. Do you find it possible to publish in any other format except the written word? That is the monograph, the journal article, the usual things that we know are very much accepted as gold standard. Um, are there structures in place to validate your work? And do you think it is possible to encompass your work within a monograph alone? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. I, um, I was reluctant to stand up. Um, I'm not a big fan of the microphone. I would have been happier to sit there mostly because I was very surprised and pleased to find myself sitting in the well of the piano, um, which I've sat in for most of my performance career uh, with, with uh, Michal Asulawan, um, with the best listening experience uh, uh, of, of that extraordinary music and that extraordinary person. So I'm reluctant to leave one. I'm going back there as quick as I can. So that's not included in my four minutes. Um, I, 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 I probably jump around a little bit. Um, on the way up in the car, I heard um, a, a guru of business and, and management, um, a man called Jules Goddard, and, uh, who writes about leadership uh, in, in business and in management. And he's talking uh, about his book on uh, the maverick in, in business and the maverick and leadership. And uh, he made a very nice point, um, uh, which, really, which really struck me about uh, the, how difficult it can be for mavericks in institutions to, to make their mark, to be heard. And he made the very simple suggestion that one of the best ways, of course, is to join with other mavericks, to connect up with other mavericks. Um, and he said, in, a, in a, uh, an alternative to the model of leadership and followers, to do that as a, as a set of companions. So to, to, to build up uh, a companionship. And it, it strikes me that this is what is going on here this, this weekend. There's a strong sense of, of companionship and, so, and strength in numbers. And last year, uh, with the support of an IRC New Foundations Award, IMBUS and Solstice Art Centre um, hosted a seminar called the Perspectives Seminar. And the, uh, the aim of that seminar was to, to expand the conversation uh, beyond the walls of the institutions about arts practice research and to move that conversation into the artistic community to, to, to really uh, energize that dialogue. And that's why we partnered with our companions in the Solstice Art Centre. And we invited eight artists and scholars, or artist scholars, to come and make presentations about the work and to bring their work in those presentations, which they did very successfully. It's a, a, a Imbus is very committed to working across the arts, so, so there were artists there um, from music, from theatre, from, from dance, and from the visual arts as well. And to the extent that one can bring the work uh, in an online setting, I think that was, that, that, that was really successful. We prepared a report on that, and the report has two parts to it. One is a description of what happened in that seminar. And the other is uh, we took the opportunity to, to begin to address another uh, aim of IMBUS, which was to, to start to get an overview uh, as uh, the, the state of play of arts practice in the Irish uh, higher education institutes. And so Helen, uh, led the work on that and invited uh, our colleagues in 15 institutions to, to write what we call snapshots. Uh, I think it was 300 words we gave them, Helen. She's a demon like for the time and the words. But, um, and, so, and so we got these. Now I think of them now as actually as selfies, kind of institutional selfies. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, because you can see in the writing of them the kind of work, these are just statements, 300 word statements, but one can only imagine the conversations that happened uh, about, and, and some of those political uh, and, and otherwise, about who, was in, who would be caught in the frame of the snapshot yeah, within the institution. But it's a fascinating read, and it's published now, you can, you can see it on the Imbus website, it's also on the Solstice Arts, Arts website. 
One of the things that occurs to me about it is that it's completely silent. Yeah? It's silent. There is no sound of it. Yeah? And I recently had a very interesting experience of another silent encounter with art. And I, I was in the Tate Modern a few weeks ago. And uh, those of you who know the Tate Modern or know of it will know that it's an extraordinary curatorial achievement. I mean, it's vast, and it's a, it's a, it's a history of, and, and you're in the presence of a, 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 a really deep history of contemporary art. I was completely overwhelmed. I'm, I, re I couldn't really cope with it after a certain point in time. Every room is not just full of visual art. Look, that's for me. Music, yeah. yeah, that's good. It's not just full of it's not just full of visual art, but it's silent. Yeah, apart from the hum of people, most of whom I assumed had COVID, and so it's but it's 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 the sound of that, but also it's deafening with the sound of ideas and artistic commitment. Yeah, to discourse around politics and 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 and, and artistic commitment to expression, and it made me wonder if we were to curate a different kind of a different kind of mapping of the state of arts practice in Ireland at the moment. And here I'm inspired by, by the work of, 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 um, of Neve O'Brien, who's sitting here. Neve is going to do a presentation tomorrow. Neve is a harper, a composer, sound artist, and a scholar. And Neve's interested in the concept of deep sonic mapping. And I began to think, what would it be like to create a deep sonic map of arts practice in Ireland. That would be a fascinating museum to walk into. Every room sounding differently. Some of them would be rooms like my daughter in the, in the, in, in the Tate Modern said, that's not music or that's not art. I could do that, an eight-year-old could do that, yeah? I'd probably be in that room. So there's, there's something about um, uh, that for me of two things. One, in the evaluation and our engagement with the institutions, can we remain maverick somehow or other? Yeah, can we hold on to some of that energy? Two, can somehow or other in the translation, and I want to suggest the word here, transcription of what we do, can we hold on to some of the energy of the sound and the movement of what we work, of, of what we do, so that it's not all completely reduced? Universities don't hear well. They're a bit deaf. That's my, that's my experience at institutions. But what they're very, very good at is documentation. They're very good at inscription, yeah? And if we can find ways to translate and to inscribe and to use the concept, at least, in our imagination of transcription, perhaps we can hold on to some of the things that are also essential to the work that we would do. That's my... Thank you. Thank you. I'm always the shortest one at the podium, so I'm used to this kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm so happy to be here in person with live people. I, I realized this morning that I had to iron the back of my blouse as well, which is new from, <laughs> from Zoom life after these years. Um, so uh, I might talk just a little bit about that documentation side of things that <laughs> universities like. Uh, who I am, and I, what I'm mostly going to do is tell you what we do, because I think we're the kind of slight odd duck in the room, um, in a room full of musicians and musicologists and the rest. I'm the director of the Digital Repository of Ireland. So this is a national repository for Ireland's arts, humanities, and social sciences data. So purposely, purposefully built to cover that kind of data and not things like um, the bits that come out of the large Hadron Collider and, and that sort of thing at CERN. Um, and that's important because you need to um, focus on the kinds of data that you want to preserve and have expertise around it. We're also a research center. We run, run different research projects around digital archiving, around digital preservation, and also open research practices has been a very uh, big focus for us in the last number of years. And my colleague Daniel will speak to that a little bit more. Um, but in my past, uh, I was a lecturer in theater and film. So I come from an academic background, uh, literature, theory, performance studies, that kind of thing. Um, but I also directed theater. So I did work in arts practice research. Um, and I was interested in digital pedagogies and in digital practices in teaching and learning. So there's the tour of what brought me to this uh, particular role. So what is DRI? It is an online archive. 
Okay, simply put, it's accessible over the web, but there's lots of processes that go on behind the scenes to keep things safe. And Una and I were talking about a website that disappeared, um, and this happens all the time. So websites are not digital preservation, they're just a method for sharing. Um, and you should, if you have something very important on the website, then you should think to how you want to preserve that in a different kind of way. So preservation is a process over time, and that's what we do. Um, but to me, and certainly institutionally, um, we don't really see preservation for the sake of preservation in the sense that preservation is about providing access. It's about providing sustained access to what is in that archive. There are things called dark archives. There are repositories that are not open. We, we very much veer on the side of openness. Um, I don't see the point in saving things forever if you can't actually take a look at them. So I think um, the history of DRI is interesting for this particular panel because we're funded by education or now further higher education, research, innovation, and science, um, which <laughs> all the department names are getting longer. <laughs> uh, but our focus has been on, um, on data from the cultural sector for the most part. And that is shifting over time to take in research data from universities. And that is, that is a growing focus of ours. But the GLAMs, the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, has been um, where our focus has been. And I should note also that when I say data, I mean all the other bits that are not monographs or journal articles. We do have some of those, um, especially if they're older and historical uh, and have become kind of interesting as documents in and of themselves. But uh, the focus is on the other kinds of outputs. Um, and you can see this kind of dual history that we have between education and culture, because depending on which audience I'm talking to, and you guys are both, um, I may say that we archive social and cultural data, or I may say that we archive data from arts, humanities, and social sciences. But they're the same thing, is the secret, right? Um, I think these sectors used to be a little bit further apart, but I see them converging, and I think movements towards digitization and towards preservation have been have hit both of these sectors in similar and slightly different ways. So for culture, there's been a real push for cultural institutions to make data available online so that you don't have to travel and stay in the archive for two weeks. Um, the pandemic is the most obvious uh, reason we've had to show why online accessibility is very useful. Um, but also, you know, uh, the institutions have to deal with their KPIs and their metrics and how many people are coming through the door. Well, going onto the website is also a kind of virtual way of coming through the door. So the pressure's been there to do that, and that's been quite good. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'll uh, try to wrap up, <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> um, uh, and for education and research, um, accessibility uh, has and digitization have pushed towards something slightly different. And this is the open research movement that Daniel will talk about. So uh, making your content available or making your other research puts, outputs available so they can be reused uh, for purposes of research integrity, transparency, reproducibility, and those kinds of things. So we see these coming together now. And we've been doing a lot of events around fair data, data that's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable for the GLAM sector, which brings them together. Um, and uh, okay, so I'm past my four minutes, so I will try to wrap up with a little bit of a story um, in the sense that I see other parallels there as well. When I was doing my PhD or starting it, the better part of 20 years ago in Toronto, um, there were movements then to have arts practice acknowledged in any way as research. This is an old conversation, right? And as an early career researcher, um, I would spend the better part of a year researching, doing dramaturgical work on a production, uh, you know, into performance styles, all sorts of things, perhaps approaching it through a particular theoretical lens, I'd mount a production. That didn't count in the way that having spent a year to write a journal article counted, certainly for trying to get a job in academia, right, which is my background. Um, so um, those things weren't considered CV worthy, right? I don't actually have recordings of the plays that I directed, and I'm quite sad about that because issues around copyright were so challenging, and they, they remain as well, right? Um, so um, I, I see that this conversation that's been taking place around the recognition uh, and the sort of merit value and evaluation of other research outputs has been happening for a long time. But I see a really interesting moment now with what some um, researchers may think of as a, a frustrating push towards open access and towards sharing research data. It's a lot of work. There's no doubt that it takes a kind of effort and that has to be acknowledged, that's really key. Um, but there is also an opportunity there to say, 
look at my research outputs and these are valuable. They are now being valued from a kind of academic or from a higher research level perspective in a, in a new kind of way. So I think that's very exciting. I will jump to my question, which is on my third page. <laughs> the font's really big though. Um, so. Um, the, the, the last thing I want to say is that you, but in order for those outputs to be seen, you need to put them somewhere. And that is not your own hard drive or a thumb drive, right? That is out there in ways that they can be accessed um, and organized that people can find it. So the, the question I would put out to you is if you were to make your research outputs, your arts practice-based research outputs, available in a repository, open for people to see, which is what you want, what would you want them to do with those outputs? Because part of the push of open research or open science is about reuse, right? And there is a, a, a kind of um, recommendation to make licenses for sharing your outputs very open, right? So that others can reuse them. So how could you see the work you're doing uh, being reused and how comfortable are you with the kinds of reuse that could happen? Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thanks, Helen, for the invitation to be at this very, I think, a timely conversation. And uh, I've enjoyed the, the keynote from Anu earlier today. So as uh, Helen mentioned, I'm Ireland's National Open Research Coordinator. I'm based at the Digital Repository of Ireland. And in this role, I work with Ireland's National Open Research Forum to coordinate and drive the agenda for open research in Ireland. So I like to define also this, this area because it is multifaceted and can be unfamiliar to, to others. So to take a definition from UNESCO, open science or open research, as we refer to it here, is defined as an inclusive con construct that combines various movements and practices aiming to make multilingual scientific knowledge openly available, accessible and reusable for everyone, to secondly, increase scientific collaborations and sharing of information for the benefits of science and society. And lastly, to open the processes of scientific knowledge creation, evaluation and communication to societal actors beyond the traditional scientific community. So putting that, that together in a national context, NORF, or the National Open Research Forum, is a group of stakeholders from across the, the system it's chaired by the Higher Education Authority and the Health Research Board. And uh, in previous iterations of this work, we've developed Ireland's national framework on the transition to an open research environment. I guess that's a, a policy setting uh, document that sets objectives for making Irish research openly accessible by default, for responsible management and sharing of research data, for the appropriate infrastructures to be developed, for skills and training in this area, and for open research practices to be incentivized and rewarded. Over the last year or so, we've been following that up with a national action plan, which we're due to release for consultation, in which actions are described to help meet these objectives, and initial resourcing has been committed by the Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science. The impetus for this work at the national level comes from international recommendations by UNESCO, the European Commission, and many others. And in general, the argument behind it is that openness allows for broader transparency, for broader dissemination, evaluation, and scrutiny, and promotes equal access to knowledge for the benefits of colleagues worldwide and society at large. At the national level, we want to move this agenda forward in an inclusive and a sustainable way. So conversations like this with disciplinary communities and domain experts are key in my view. Coincidentally, and more on the personal side, my own academic background is in music performance research. I covered historical performance practices, music psychology, and digital musicology. In fact, some of the work relates to what Anna was speaking about earlier in that I was interested in, in the experience of intuition in an artistic context. And I just wanted to highlight from this dual perspective in policy and in research that I think there are two, at least two key opportunities for music scholars in this space. One, one relates to dissemination and communication and the other to recognition and reward. 
To the first point, I think there's an opportunity to contribute to reimagining the way research processes and outputs are communicated. For instance, music is an excellent example here of heterogeneous representation, covering symbolic audiovisual annotations, creative and practice-based outputs, and so on. We should aim to fully leverage the potential of digital technologies, for example, to share, link, and communicate these outputs to the broadest possible audience. So Helen had a nice line about sharing what we value, and perhaps we can add to that, we also need to then assess what we value. And so secondly, to come to that point, we can play a part in the shift towards broad and inclusive assessment of research and researchers that acknowledges and supports a diversity of contributions and careers. This generally requires a culture shift. Part of that is to acknowledge a diversity of outputs as first-class research objects, and secondly then a reor reorientation away from journal and publication metrics towards more qualitative measures and the responsible use of quantitative indicators. So the, those, I think, go hand in hand. And I'll just close then with a final question. So thinking about this longer term national agenda um, and what we're putting forward is a vision for up to 2030. So there is space for further, further action and further conversations in this area. What is one thing we could do as a nationally coordinated action to advance open sharing of practice-based research? Is, is, it, is it in the policy area? Is it a, a framework for engagement? Scoping work related to infrastructure maybe? Is it training, incentivization? What would deliver the most impact? So I'll leave it there, thank you. Hey, hello everybody. Um, I'm Anna Wehlainen from uh, Sibelius Academy Dogmus Doctor School, and I, I'm probably going to talk a bit about assessing artistic research in doctoral degrees. And um, I try to have a very practical perspective. This is what we do, this is what we have been doing lately, a lot, and concentrating on that. Uh, at the Sibelius Academy, we have had doctors of music approximately 30 years now, and we have three programs, uh, research program, applied study program, and the art study program, which I work in. And um, the structure of this art study program is uh, most often uh, five, uh, used to be like that, five artistic components, like concerts. That's the most usual way to do it. Five concerts and then a thesis, a written part. And for that, the assessment was that we had an artistic panel, like five or six members who were assessing the artistic part. And then there was uh, two pre-examiners and, and then uh, one, pre, uh, one examiner for the written part. And the, it was quite easy to find these people, the expertise for each different things, but nobody was really assessing the whole thing, the whole research project. There were artists assessing the art, artistic parts and then written part elsewhere. So that was a problem for us and we have uh, been de developing the, the structure ever since. And um, for two years we've had the new system, which is more flexible. It also started to be too big to have five recitals and then a huge thesis with that. Uh, now it's two to four uh, artistic components plus a written component. It can be articles and it can be a monographic, but it, it, you can choose uh, quite freely. So uh, the panel is different now. We have one panel with three members and all the three members of the panel are assessing everything. So if there's a pianist doing a decree, we have certainly maybe one or two pianists in the panel and they are of course hearing all the concerts and they are reading everything that is written. And at the end of the project, uh, all three are together making the uh, assessment. And uh, as we have done this all, only two years now, we don't, have, we don't really have the knowledge how this works, but I'm, I'm optimistic. Of course, it's, uh, the challenge might be to find right people uh, who are capable of assessing everything, like research uh, issues and also artistic issues in high quality music making. But anyway, in future, when we will have more doctors uh, in artistic research, I think it's, uh, it's a good path. Uh, the pandemic caused 
um, uh, we all know what happened during the pandemic. We wanted to uh, make sure that the doctoral degrees are going on and, uh, and um, it was difficult to get people to the live situation. So we needed to make sure that recording of a concert might work as well. Uh, so if there is a doctoral concert, it's possible to uh, assess it uh, like afterwards because we have recordings for that. And this is maybe the, the I'm trying to mold a question from that because um, what happens if everything starts to be more online and in digital forms? What happens to the live mm -hmm. contact? So this is what we probably all are thinking about at the moment. Um, I'm really hoping <laughs> the clock to Korean <laughs> because this is all I have now. Um, <laughs> what else? What I, 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 <laughs> I could say something about the open access, but I, mostly I think that uh, in Uniars we have excellent libraries, library uh, staff, and they are creating uh, guidelines to, to help us all the time. They are coming to our seminars and courses, and they uh, tell what is new at the moment. And um, I believe that in, in, uh, when we try to archive uh, artistic components like whole concerts is difficult because w there are copyright issues and all that. So we are, there are many ongoing processes going on. But uh, I think I, I, I end here because there are too many other things. We can continue later and get the audience with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm David Horn. I'm the head of the graduate school at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. And I also have oversight of all of the performance PhDs and all of the applications. And what is really interesting is that in recent years, we see these applications increase manyfold. Indeed, artistic researchers now by far are the majority of the PhD researchers uh, that are in CM. Um, our program is very new. Um, our first PhD in performance, one of my, my wonderful, wonderful um, students, uh, was a, is a Ukrainian pianist who was researching music by a Russian composer. Um, so all of that in, in the current situation just shows you how arts and artistic research transcends many of the boundaries that, that do divide us so often. Now, one thing that came up um, several times in, in, in other colleagues' presentations was this notion of impact. Um, and impact and dissemination is always something which is really important for any of the bodies. In our case in the UK, it's called the REF, uh, the Research Exercise Framework, and they assess the quality, I'm putting that in sneer quotes, these are sneer quotes, they assess the quality of the various um, artistic outputs from various institutions. This is a serious business because it deeply affects the funding. Um, so if you get a lot of four star, the highest, um, then the funding can increase quite a lot. The only problem is it's not always clear what the, the rubric is for assessing the quality of these outputs. And indeed, um, it does seem to change from one exercise to another. So when conservatoires first got into this, it was actually in the early noughties, and they all just sent off their CDs of their you know, heads of schools performing with the LSO, and they all got four stars. And they all thought, this is great. So five years later, they did the same thing again, and they all got one star. <laughs> so it, it's just a reminder that this is constantly changing. But I think when it comes to artistic research, there's actually already a wonderful story about impact and dissemination, because the fact is that's what artistic researchers do. They are creating performances, they are creating new artistic works because they want them to be experienced, they want them to have impact, they, they want to change things, they want to change the world um, often. So I think we've already got a very good case there for the impact, but I think the real problem that we have is how we assess these. And I have to be really blunt and say that the problem is as much to do with the assessors as the people actually creating the art. So, so this is a fight, I think. Um, one thing that I would note is it's quite clear with um, colleagues here in Ireland that you have exactly the same concerns that we have in the UK and that I know that many colleagues have in, in um, you know, continental Europe and further afield. So I think it's really important that we collaborate more to, to actually get our heads together to see what will actually work the most effectively. Um, but I also think artistic research really is so dynamic, it allows us to, to quickly adapt to the world, to, to world events. 
sense. Um, it's notable, for example, a lot of our successful collaborations in terms of getting funding recently have been responding very much to you know, local events, local situations. Um, at the moment, for example, certain things we're thinking about, we're looking at underrepresented composers, composers who you know, really have been forgotten about for the last 200, 300 years. It's been wonderful also to notice that some of the, the presentations in this fantastic conference are always also around this kind of work as well. Um, even more recent events, the Me Too movement, for example, is already creating operas. You know, there are performers getting involved in this, there are composers, you know, wanting to create works that are responding to this. This has real immediacy and, and real impact. So I do think it's very difficult. I think it's a challenging environment because the rules are always changing, and unfortunately, we are not always in charge of those rules. Um, I think we need to be more proactive to get involved, to become a part of the rule-making bodies wherever possible. But I think we mustn't forget, as artistic researchers, that we do have impact. We've, we've got a remarkable story to tell. And of course, it's not just music, it's across all the arts and artistic research. So I would say that's actually a very positive thing indeed. So thank you very much. I mean, is it just, just, just such a rich wealth of experience here? And I think provocation, questions. I want to open it to the floor now. One of the things that was really interesting that we found in those snapshots that Mel mentioned is that so much of this work is person-led and passion-led. You know, there are advocates in various um, places across Ireland and internationally who are pushing this agenda forward. But we, we really feel the next step now is to collectively use that same passion to develop. There's nobody better positioned than ourselves to develop the kinds of guidelines, the kinds of policy that we need for the sustainability of the recognition of this work. So with that, could I just open the floor to any questions or reflections that people might have? There might be an individual member of the panel you'd like to address it to, or it could be, it could be more general, and then people can just pick it up themselves. Is it Simon, is it? Yeah, please, thank you. Thanks. Simon thanks a lot for the panel. This is addressed for David and firstly and then everybody else as well. I know wants to chip in. He, one of the big issues I think, certainly because I'm familiar with the UK scene, is our composers when it comes to practice research. Now, there's a, there's a real tension in my mind anyway between the ways in which they have essentially used terminology for practice research to categorize their outputs uh, as practice research over the last 20 years or so since 1998. Um, and my sense is that there's a, something needs to be resolved there in the sense of they, they, still, they still essentially are working in a narrative where they produce a work which is primarily textual, whether or not it's digital. And that, in, in some senses, because there's so many of them in the academy, I think is an obstacle for people who want to produce imminent performative work as an output, because they're so invested in outputs that are essentially static. And I just wanted to know what your, your thoughts are in relation to how do composers essentially fit in to this growing sense of, of practice research outputs and how we value it? The question, Simon. And I might start at the beginning going backwards. I think actually composers are probably thinking more about it now than we were 10 years ago. In other words, the idea that an artistic out, a research output is simply a big orchestral piece that you've written for the symphony orchestra. That kind of thing nowadays is actually not valued as much. And um, there does need to be um, an artistic question behind it. And um, I mean, I know it's, I don't want to be um, too reductive, but I mean, the, the simple essential um, components of research, what's the question? What's the methodology? 
what's the result? And I know that's simplistic, but um, composers who are really attuned to kind of thinking about um, artistic research, and I suppose um, cynically, if they're working with an academy to think about what will get the best results, are thinking much more along those lines now rather than, oh, amazing, I've written 10 piano sonatas to get them recorded by this amazing pianist. That's not seen so much now as, as research. Um, I think there's still a problem also with um, getting performance involved and to get performance engaged and to get performance to, uh, to think about the questions and the, the problems involved. I mean, some of my colleagues here are, are working in um, performance studies in other disciplines, and especially the performance studies in, in drama, in, in dance, has always been quite a bit more developed than in music, and indeed a lot of us have been kind of reading up on what these colleagues have been doing to learn from that. Um, I do think we've still got a lot to learn, but I'm not sure that answers the question. I completely understand where you're coming from, but in the same way that we can no longer just send off an ICD of the BBC Film like playing piece, you know, there's got to be there's got to be research done. Super, thanks so much, Steve. Anybody else want to comment? Well just to say yeah, um, Simon Oh my god. Um, <coughs> Of course, I think there's a lot of different type of composition, and um, and I think that uh, certainly the composers that I um, whose work I'm familiar with, uh, working uh, either for their PhDs or or um, as researchers, um, there that would be that idea of a of a of a a, a, a notated score actually would be. Um, it's a minority, uh, I, I would have thought. It's a minority sport at this stage. And um, so a lot of the composers, I think, who are working, are working in various ways. They're also um, often performers, sound artists, um, and they are often working in, in experimental ways. And I think critically, they're, they're thinking about um, the composition Something, to, something now around uh, this question of David's about, about a research question, but somehow or other that the compositional process itself is an intrinsic